Hi everyone, it's Chris Jowlin here from Sunderland Shorts Film Festival. I'm the festival coordinator for this, the sixth year of the Sunderland Shorts Film Festival, uh, based in the northeast of England. Um, this is our first attempt at an online uh, film screening, uh, slightly different from what we normally do. We're obviously kind of usually based uh, in the city centre, but with the current unfolding and sort of unprecedented conditions, um, we thought we'd try something a little bit different um, just to give our audiences and our filmmakers um, a little bit of something back, something a little bit uh, maybe different from the current ongoing news cycle uh, for a little bit of a break, but also for a little bit of uh, an insight into what we do and what we offer. Sunland Shorts is all about bringing local, national and international talent uh, to the North East and giving it a platform to have those pieces of work shown um, in the sort of environment that they deserve and with the recognition that these filmmakers deserve to get. Short films as a medium are something which we aren't necessarily always as familiar with uh, compared to, you know, documentaries uh, we used to sing on TV or films we used to sing in the cinema. They're a slightly different entity, um, often from, you know, emerging talents, developing talents, student talents, um, but, you know, established talents as well. But I think they're just as worthy um, to get their message out there and something that we're very honoured to give a platform for. Tonight we're really focusing that spotlight on some of our North East talent. Um, we've got a range of dramas, documentaries, comedies, as well as student films um, that give you hopefully a little bit of a flavour of what the North East has to offer in regards to filmmaking talent, um, but also as a festival some of the things that we uh, are really proud to kind of display. If you are a filmmaker and want to get involved in this year's upcoming Sunland Shorts Film Festival, we're currently taking submissions on filmfreeway.com slash Sunderland Shorts. Um, and at the minute, if you get involved, you'll actually be able to take advantage of our early bird pricing uh, and get a bit of a discount that way. Previous uh, filmmakers who may be watching this, hello, uh, first off, but you will also be entitled to an alumni discount and any film students who are watching you'll be able to take advantage of a discount as well. Um, and shining a spotlight on student work, up and coming work is something, again, we're really all about. Um, so we'd love you to take part. Do get in touch if you have any questions about the festival. Um, again, across our social media channels, on Facebook, on Instagram, on Twitter. And we'd love to help you out um, and hopefully get you shown at Sunland Shorts later this year. For this evening, I hope you enjoy the programme that we've got on offer uh, from a range of different genres, uh, but all kind of films from originating in the North East. Um, if you enjoy this uh, and it as well, we'd love to do another one of these screenings to show off some of our uh, other fantastic films that we've had shown over the last previous five festivals. Um, we hope you get involved in the sixth festival. Um, but for now, I hope you enjoy tonight's screening. I'm sorry, Mr. Reed, but your mum passed away about an hour ago. Would you like to see her? She just looks like she's asleep. She is definitely dead, isn't she? Uh, yeah. Of course. It's just that when I was a kid, we had this hamster. We thought he was dead. Mm. All the fuss we went through digging a hole and having like a little party funeral thing. It was upside down one minute and then it jumped up, fucked off. I mean, I know hamsters are a little bit different to humans, but still it happened. I'm sure he did it on purpose though. Did you see him again? Yeah. Yeah, about a week later. You came home? Well, neighbour's cat killed him. Oh. 
and the kids had put a rubber band round his head and battery up his arse. Kids in our area, bastards. Uh, right, um, well, look, it's, uh, it's really busy here tonight. Yeah, sure. Um, take as long as you need. Yeah, you want. Get yourself off. Oh, um, your sister called. She's on her way in. Mum? Mum? Has already called. It's not that. It's just. It looks like your brother's left. With your mother. What do you mean, looks like? Well, I mean, we checked the CCTV and he left with her. Well, why the fuck didn't you stop him? Well, it's... Have you met him? You can't be trusted with a hamster, let alone mum's dead body. Have you called the police? We have, but it's a Saturday and they're really busy. And... How long ago? Um, we phoned them just before. Not the police. When did they... When did he leave? Um, uh, hang on a second. Uh, how long ago did he leave? Fuck her! Sorry? Not you. Don't worry, I'll have them back. Ben! Ben! What are you playing at? You right, Sam? What the fuck? It's all they got at the 24-hour garage, all right? Don't be a cock. They've already called the police. Do you think I care? If she'd have hated it in there, Sam, it stank a piss. I'm taking her home. Don't be ridiculous. She's dead. See, I knew you wouldn't understand. You always missed the point. What's that supposed to mean? Exactly. Do you remember when we went to Metroland with Mum? Yeah. It was class. It must have been. You were seven and I was five. Do you know how I remember that? Next, yeah, it was the day after Dad had fucked off and she just wanted to treat us both. You went on the dodgums. Remember? I was too little. So I had to go on the merry-go-round. There's nothing wrong with a merry-go-round. Ah, but it did take forever to go around, though. I mean, it was the most amazing feeling of excitement. The music was deafening, and I was riding this big fucking white horse. But every time it came around, I seen Mum. Stood there in floods of tears. <sighs> Uncontrollable tears, and I couldn't do anything about it. Imagine it. Excitement. Mum in tears, excitement, tears, and on and on, and then just past Mum, spotted you. Having the time of your fucking life on the Dodgems. Just remember the Dodgems. And that's my point. Some people get to enjoy the Dodgems, Sam, whilst others have to stand around and watch the pain come round each time. Sounds fucking daft now. Help me get Mum in the car. Oh, Sam, can't now. we just...
why he ended up getting left. Sam, where are you going? God, it hasn't changed at all. Yeah, it's not a good thing. It hasn't aged well. You know we came here before that? With Mum and Dad. You're only little. Mum really wanted to ride the pirate ship. She did fucking love pirates, didn't she, yeah? She's just scared of heights. Exactly. Although we didn't know that at the time. Anyway, just as the ride's about to start, you start to freak out. So then she starts to freak out. I mean, she was going fucking mental. Crying, screaming, swearing. And then you start to cry. So they had to take us off the ride. But Dad, he stayed on. And we watched Dad swinging back and forth, having the time of his life. Mum was having one of them panic attacks. You know what I realised? That day in that moment. That our dad was a fucking twat. Should have been us on that pirate ship and him stood there. Mum was a fucking tit rifle. We're gonna do something we should have done a long time ago. Come on. Oh, this is fucking mental. Well, that's fucking mental. <laughs> oh, see? They've loved it. That's what we used to be like. I'm sorry, there's no balloons on the sugar boat, so I'll have those until you're off the ride. Thanks very much. Shit, Jobsworth, I calm. Hello, love. Are you able to get up out the wheelchair? Is she? Is she all... Yeah, she's dead. Yeah, she died last night. I was just on my way to take her home, but my sister thought it'd be a better idea to come and let her ride the pirate ship. I mean, I think it's a really stupid idea, but it is her mum as well, so what can you do? OK, mate, no need to be like that. I was just going to say that the pirate ship isn't disabled friendly. Now, we do have some other rides, but if you're all OK getting out the wheelchair, then I can help you. No, she can't. We've tried. Disgrace. This is a disgrace. It's discrimination. You would not get this shit at Legoland. Come on. You are a bad man. Ben! Bad man! Ben! <laughs> <laughs> Dodgems, come on! No, 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 we can't, we can't. Won't be fine on her own. Sam... Don't you think it's a shame that you never got to be a real pirate and ride the ship? Maybe that's just life. Maybe... Maybe only dickheads get to be real pirates. Then maybe we need to be dickheads, Sam. <laughs> Give him the money, Sam. What can we get for that? Enjoy the ride, sir. Tell you what, he's hundred. I'll knife him. God, no, no, don't, don't knife anyone. Just no. take the money and get his attention for a few seconds. That's it. Fine. Sorry, mate, uh, you couldn't tell us where I could get any cigarettes or anything, could you? Ooh, cigarettes are much... Oh. Oh. Go. Ah. go! Go, 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 go! go, go, go. <laughs> we have a Code 5 at the pirate ship. I repeat, a Code 5! Oh, for fuck's sake, Jim. Did someone kick you with the nuts again? Great, man. Ha <laughs> ha!
if you think drag is a gender thing, then you don't understand it, simply. I've always had a problem with the term for queen. It implies that our drag isn't as valid as a male drag queen's. People need to look at us as characters and performers, like you would any queen, and not just as a girl with a wig on and excessive makeup. When I'm out and about and I'm not in drag, people judge through appearance and the amount of unnecessary sympathy I'll get off people is ridiculous. Whereas when I am in drag, nobody would dare say anything like that to Venus. I wouldn't let them. Whereas normally I'd probably just smile and let them say what they wanted. I think of my drag as kind of a big fuck you to everyone. I like how being a girl makes us stand out from the other drag queens. Um, I've always been different from people and even when I do fit in somewhere, I still stand out. I like that drag is a platform to be noticed and to be recognised. I like that when you're on stage you command attention. As a girl it's really easy to be ignored and not be taken seriously. Whereas when you're on stage people have to watch what you're doing and the entire focus is on you and that's a really empowering feeling to have. When I perform, I feel powerful. I feel like I can be 100% who I want to be. I don't have to hold anything back. I do drag because I like having that creative outlet. It lets you be whatever kind of person you want to be and it lets you completely change how other people see you and what I'd like to get out of my drag is that I'd like to influence people and maybe show people who aren't that confident or who don't fit in that they can do whatever they want and that I'm an example of that. The amount of people who appreciate you for what you do, but it's it's amazing, and um, and drag really has made me grow as a person.
Kate, you never told me you had a daughter. Isn't she adorable? That's pretty good. Where'd you get him from? Aren't they lovely, Casey? Yeah. Yeah. They are. Uh, I was just in mind when Casey's doll. Oh, she loves her dolls. Takes them everywhere. Oh, that must be the babysitter. So sorry about that, kid. You're finished. Yes, thank you. It's fine. Just relax. Let's start over. What hobbies do you have? I like to zumba. I like music. I mean, it's meant to be a job. I mean, I've got to be because I earn fifty thousand pounds a year. So, kind of got to be me. Sorry.
a bed. I couldn't sleep. Come here then. What are we reading tonight? What about... This one. Okay. Hey diddle diddle, the cat and the fiddle, the cow jumped over the moon. <laughs> The little dog laughed to see such sport, and the dish ran away with the spoon. <laughs> <laughs> I make, I make marks on people's skin with a needle and a stick. I'm nothing special. I'm an artist of sorts and a magician, but I can't reveal my secrets. <laughs> nothing up my sleeves though. I'm obsessed with the dots. The dots are my life. I make work from dots, like painting a picture out of grains of sand. And I like that you can break it down to the single pixel, you know, that it could all fall like a deck of cards, but it doesn't because it's in the skin. So I don't know, I'm obsessed with the dots. The dots are, the dots are my life. That's a really interesting sound when it pops. What I do is a very, very repetitive thing. But I find a, a piece, I feel like I'm, I feel like I'm a drummer and I'm drumming the skin. It's just, I'm drumming with very sharp points and, and I'm drumming on hide. It's just, I leave marks after I make a beat. It is all about the dots for me. I work, I work a dot at a time and I build up from one dot and it can seem so insignificant, something that small, but it's so enormous. The connotations and everything that has been pulled into that, that one concentration of that point. It's such a life-changing thing. It's, it's such a full-on responsibility as well. And I don't take this responsibility lightly. I, I still see it. It's one of our oldest rituals. And I still believe in the magic of this ritual. It's a... It's a very sacred thing. It's a, it's a very powerful magic. Symbology, uh, I guess, if you're going to tattoo it, you've got to understand what it is.
there, there's a lot of there's a lot of mantras and symbols and as you can see there's a lot of swastika there's a lot of swastika within my within my tattoo and, and always from day one i think one of the first things i tattooed was a swastika so. it was the book modern primitives and discovering man woman in modern primitives that made me aware of the swastika as a a, a universal the most universal sacred mark that existed to man it's a religious mark, you see, especially in the context of Buddhism, we see it as the Srivatsa on the Buddha's chest, you know. It was already a Buddhist sign before it became a Nazi sign. Uh, and it's very clear the difference between what's a fascist mark and what isn't, you know. And I have lots, I have big swastikas on me and they're not hidden, you know. I, it, even this on my face actually says swastika, even though it's in a, in a Tibetan script. I prefer black and white. I don't draw in colour. I translate everything into dots. If I had to then think about translating that into colour, I think my head would explode. Being tattooed is like a reclamation of self. And we can be as selfish as we want, man. This is ours. We can do whatever the fuck we want with it, you know? And there's no one who can say, you're doing it wrong. Or, they can, but at the end of the day, my body, my decision, these are my work clothes, you know? This is, my, this, this is my work outfit, I stand by what I do. It's a discipline to get it right. Uh, but I believe if you're gonna do something well, you should dedicate yourself to it. And I'm obsessive, I'll never be happy. And every piece of art, even though it's a nice piece of art, it's not perfect. And I think the day I make that perfect tattoo, that's it man, I'll give up, I'll go, okay, I've done it, I've done it. I hope I never reach that though. And I, I hope it is an unattainable thing. Where is this straight world? I don't know, man. I live in fucking tattoo land where it's all dots and I'm obsessed. A spire rises out of the river. Steel cables moored to the banks. Concrete foundations anchored in the riverbed. Waves ripple on the water. Shadows cast on the rubble. Sunderland builds again. A thick silt lies on the riverbed. The smell of salt drifts in the air. A silence descended over the river. Well, I think sadness was obviously um, one of the feelings, but I think bitterness um, was the greatest feeling. Deep down he knew there was a wrong being committed and he couldn't put it right. Uh, we tried, the world workforce tried, the state together, uh, they were very strong, but at the end of the day when you're fighting uh, the establishment and the government, then it's very, very difficult, if not impossible. In the face of closure, Union men banded together, bringing Pallion back from the brink. Five remain. Well, I thought it was a disgrace, really. Like It was just political to shut down. Maggie Thatcher wanted to shut them down, that was it. Same as the pits. 
She wanted to kill the unions, and that's that's what she got. Boat to ship, oak to steel, swelling and flooding the weir. I always said I was born and gone in the shipyards, me, because I was born on the on the doorsteps. I didn't know what to do when I left school, to be honest with you. And obviously, my father come in with a form, fill that in, and next thing I know, I'm apprenticed at the shipyards. That's what happened anyway in them days. Thousands of men and boys march to the Docklands. Platers, welders, riveters, caulkers, drillers, shipwrights, endlessly hammering and drilling at the steel. Australia Star. Yeah, I think everybody remembers the work of their first ship. Some days you used to look forward to going to work, because there's different characters. Couldn't explain it really, it was like, uh, what the pictures. Fathers and sons labour, calloused and weathered, gazing back in awe. It's excitement. It was like when you first go into the shipyard and you've never experienced anything like that before, experienced the launch before, you just wonder, wow, how on earth? 1988. Thatcher closed the last yard. Sunderland has been murdered today. A town set adrift. From the age of 15, from being a boy uh, for 24 years, I uh, didn't know anything else didn't know what was outside of the shipyard. Resigned caretakers. Some sitting cluttered offices, whispering of takeovers and demolitions. Others wander the empty walkways. Tinkering with mechanisms. Watching time pass. Down the dock, an apprentice down at old place, 18. He's working in the fitting shop. He's a good kid. He's working on this little lobe. And he tried to move it to come over on top of him and kill him, like. He was a young boy, you know. When a young one got killed, it affected me that way. I mean, I thought I was coming to the end of my time, you know. I didn't want to see out like that. Alien remains, quiet and still. A ship will never be built here again. Around the bend, east toward the river's mouth, there's a clamour on the bank. Noise echoes. Light leaks.
Metal is wrought and cut. A white hot glow is born on the bench. Arcs of electricity dance in the air. Men glimpse from behind their masks. A hundred men, their torches reignited. Once again set to work on steel. Creations of such immensity inspire pride. The lights here are so bright Few get to work amidst the glare. The noise from the warehouse does not reach far. Sunderland remains a quieted town. The cranes stand tall. But there are only echoes. Only shadows. The river still flows, but the tide has ebbed. Nobody watches from the banks. Truly ripped with what regard, such heat, such noise, so much, gone.
Good morning, sir. Thank you. Remember that you are my wife. I can't. I don't love him. You are happy, aren't you? Why do you ask that when you know the answer? Why? I can't help how I feel. We have to leave together. I can't leave. Why would I go? If he sends me away, imagine what he'll do to you. You have to come. I can't do this alone, please, Mina. Should meet at the signal gap tomorrow.
My name's Elliot Johnson, I'm 23 years old and I live in Newcastle. I remember way back in 2003, I saw a documentary called Jump London. Uh, my friend showed me it and we used to go out and like do parkour and like just play in the streets and stuff. A few years later in 2005, I saw the follow-up documentary called Jump Britain and it just made me love it even more. I was, I've always been like a person who's very active, like I've always been good at climbing, I've always been full of energy and I saw the documentary and I just thought it was the coolest thing in the world. Like I wanted to just do it straight away. It wasn't like a, like a thing where I was like, oh, I might try that. I was like, yes, that's for me. Hello, my name is Stephen Walker. I'm from Johannesburg, South Africa. Uh, I got into parkour through a variety of different ways. First one, I went and met a friend down in London, and this was back in like 2008, maybe a little bit earlier. We jumped, we just jumped for fun. I know only when, when I got back to South Africa, I did I pursue and look at what it was actually called, and I found an organization called PK Josie which is Parkour Johannesburg. We went and we trained and I met them. So starting from ground level, you already had a set number of guys who were very good. Uh, and let's say like well-rounded practitioners. And I continued from that. Newcastle Parkour, it's, it's a lot newer, right? It's younger. In terms of the people training in South Africa, we had people who were a lot older. They had been doing, they had been doing it for a lot longer. So you had, let's say, uh, a wiser outlook. There was a greater approach at refining the movements, at practicing the small stuff, get the, get the small stuff down and then think about making it larger. Coming to Newcastle and the community in Newcastle, which is quite young, it is very much a foundling, let's say, uh, organization. So it's you have a greater push on doing the bigger things, make the things big and wow, because that's a lot what people nowadays want to, they, they, they look at it, they think, wow, that's cool, we do big tricks, we do big jumps, right? Big jumps uh, and big movements, if done well and executed properly, are going to be twice as impressive, but then again, people on the street will only think about, can you do a backflip, can you do this, can you do that trick, and don't actually appreciate the movement as a whole, so. Yeah, South Africa's older, Newcastle new, a little bit of a mix feeling. The community side of it, everybody, the whole philosophy behind it is that everybody's like really inclusive and that we all train together and uh, it's made me like be a more positive, outgoing person, definitely. My name's Connor, I'm from Newcastle. Um, I got into the Newcastle parkour community just through my friend Craig who got me involved and uh, just been training since basically. Long story short, I used to do a different sport and I was terrible at it. so. Decided to research something else, which was parkour and free running, and I found out that my old friend from primary school used to do it as well. So basically, met him, got into it, and I've been training now for eight years. I met Elliot in France. Um, we've gone all time. When you were going down the stairs, we're alone down there. See, it's always so what's just happened is uh, we've had a member of uh, the security team come over and just tell us we have to move on. It was like a perfectly pleasant interaction. It doesn't happen often, but it will happen from time to time. Like you'll get security or a member of the public come up and say, this is private property, uh, you can't be doing uh, jumps and stuff here because if you hurt yourselves, uh, we're the ones who are liable and stuff like that. Just they're only doing their jobs and like, they're polite to us and we're polite back and they understand so it's normally a very pleasant interaction. It's, Im it's really important to present yourself like well to people who ask questions or say if someone does come try and move you on you be like as polite and respectful as possible and then hopefully they'll treat you in the same manner. Just like a basic human interaction, polite and then you'll get reciprocated that politeness.
I can't I can't think of many reasons or negative effects that parkour has on you. It's also very good for your mental strength as well because a lot of challenges you'll struggle to do in your mind, you'll think, oh, that's scary. But then you start small and you build up and you build up and then you're able to complete that task and then that's such a bonus for you. You feel such a good rush from completing the task. So that's mental and physical. Like, not many sports which give you all that rush at once and it's such an overlooked fact about parkour. Nobody realises that it does what the good it does for you. such a unique thing there's nothing like it as far as uh, a philosophy and lifestyle goes like I find that most people who do parkour behave and act in a certain way as well and it's such a it's such a positive influence on your life like I think everybody should try it at least once
Thanks so much for joining us this evening at Sunderland Shorts Film Festival's first live screening. Uh, do keep in touch if you want to find out more about our upcoming festival. Uh, do get involved if you're a filmmaker at filmfreeway.com slash Sunderland Shorts. You can find the full terms and conditions and rules for the festival there. Um, do get in touch if you've got any more questions about the festival in general though. I've been Chris Allen, the festival coordinator for Sunderland Shorts. Thanks so much again for joining us and we hope to see you again really soon. Thanks.